The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our audience to our National Road Safety Partnership Program, Draw Insights, Speed, Cars, Crashes and Recovery. This webinar is brought to you by the NRSUP in partnership with the Australian Road Research Board and Australian and New Zealand Association for the Surgery of Trauma. So for those of you who don't know, the NRSUP is has been established to provide a collaborative network for Australian businesses and organisations to help them create a positive road safety culture, both internally and externally. It aims to help organisations of all sizes across all sectors to, sh to share and build road safety initiatives specific to their own workplace and beyond. It is delivered by ARB and funded primarily by Government Coalition and ARB. So for more information, just like this webinar and other tools, please refer to our website. My name is Jerome Carslake and I'm proudly moderating the session today. I manage the NRCP and its many activities. So what we have for you today. Today's webinar will go through for approximately 35 minutes with around 25 minutes for questions um, and time throughout. We do have two presenters today, so we may go a little bit over it, but we'll see how we go for things. So we will be recording the session and we will share it upon the conclusion. So we look forward to hearing from you. And drawing on that factor, and uh, this webinar is all about being interactive. So if you have questions, please ask and share any experience you have which relate to the content. You can do this by typing your questions into the question box in your side panel at any stage of the presentation. Just note that we have a lot, very large audience today and may not be able to answer all your questions and that we don't answer. We may hopefully respond to them uh, later today. So. Now, our presenters today, we have joining us are trauma surgeons Kate and Scott. Dr. Kate Martin is General and Trauma Surgeon Supervisor and General Surgical Training at the Alfred Hos Hospital. Joining her is Mr. Scott Ferris, Deputy Director of the Alfred Hospital, RAC's Supervisor of Surgical Education and Training, Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Welcome Kate and Scott and I'll tell you one thing, we're very lucky to have you both here today because I know how busy you are and I know how much effort's gone into coordinating your time, so thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay, so um, today Scott and I are going to be speaking about um, speed, cars, crashes, and the recovery, um, using a patient's journey um, as an example for that. Trauma is a significant cause of, um, of, of resource burden on our health system, not only in Victoria, but across Australia. Trauma as a, as a disease is the fifth most common, um, the largest burden, but when it comes to death and loss of life, it's the third most common cause of loss of life, particularly with regards to um, life years lost, affecting the younger population. And as you can see, it's not only is it the third most common cause of death in Australians, for those of us up to the age of 45, it's actually the most common cause of um, death in our community. And this beats the malignancies and the cardiovascular disease in this age group. We're very lucky in Victoria in that we have a world-class trauma system. It's quite, um, it's, it's an established system. It's nearly 20 years old and it's actually regarded across the world as one of the most mature trauma systems. Geographically, we're lucky in that it's a small state and we're easily able to service the state through our regional hospitals as well as our three major trauma centres being the Royal Melbourne Hospital, the Royal Children's and the Alfred. So today's story is about Adam and Adam um, had his accident back on the 5th of August. So not too long ago, Adam was on his motorbike. Um, he's a keen um, motorbike rider and was T-boned by a car pulling out of a driveway. Um, he was traveling at the, at the speed limit, which was 60 kilometers per hour. He was wearing full protective gear. That includes his helmet, his gloves, heavy duty leather um, pants, as well as his jacket as well as a spine protector and motorcycle boots. He was ejected after hitting the car on its side about four metres. Now, he was rapidly attended to by our paramedics, our MICA paramedics um, via a road car and then was transported to the Alfred Hospital where he received all of his treatment. He didn't require going to another hospital first, he was just directly transported to the Alfred. Now, I do want to spend a bit of time just going through the injuries that Adam sustained. So even though he didn't have anything that was immediately life-threatening and that he didn't have any um, major internal bleeding or a major head injury, he did sustain significant injuries. 
Louis, the first of these was a punctured lung. And what this caused was his lung to collapse and cause problems with his breathing. He was able to cope with this initially, but we did need to do some, um, we did need to put a tube in the side of his chest in order to help him with his breathing. Adam remembers that quite well and is one of the most vivid memories he has of his time in the trauma centre. He had some rib fractures associated with that as well as some lung bruising. He had a fracture of the left forearm and this was open, which means that the bone was sticking out of his arm. He also had a fracture of that, that hand on that side, in particular his thumb. His right arm was broken. Again, it was the two bones in his forearm and they were sticking out as well. It was an open fracture and he had a fracture in the hand on that side also. He also had fractures of the two bones in his lower leg and he had a very severe fracture of his um, left ankle also that involved both sides of the ankle. He also had a ligamentous injury on the right hand side um, that caused a disruption of one of the ligaments in his knee. He had a fracture of the clavicle where it joins onto the breastbone, otherwise known as the sternum. He had a laceration across his neck, which thankfully didn't involve any of the major vessels or his airways. He had a fractured scapula or shoulder blade on that left hand side. And as we'll explain later too, he also had an injury to the nerves um, around his left shoulder, the nerves that run from the neck down into his left arm. So these were the injuries that Adam came into our trauma centre with. As you can see, all four limbs were injured, three of them quite significantly. And here's just a snapshot of, some of, of what some of Adam's injuries looked like when he first presented to the emergency department. Now, when Adam first arrived, um, he fulfilled the criteria of a major trauma. So he had a full trauma response, which means he had a team that met him. We had to help him with his breathing, particularly as we put that chest tube in. So we gave him a essentially gave him a general anaesthetic, which put him into an induced coma. He required blood transfusion because he lost quite a lot of blood from those bleeding bones. He then over the next couple of weeks went on to four separate rounds of surgery. On that first day he arrived, before going anywhere else, he left our emergency department and went up to the operating room. We had quite a number of those bones fixed, some of it temporarily, some of it um, was, was the, the formal or the definitive um, fixation of those bones. He also needed to have the skin over both of his forearms split to allow the muscles to swell. Because of the extent of his fractures, they left a, there was a lot of tissue swelling that was occurring and that was going to put the muscles at risk of having their blood supply cut off because they were so swollen. So he essentially had to have both of his forearms split open. A couple of days later on day four, he then had to go on for his next round of surgery and attention to some of those wounds. And then he continued on day five, some skin grafts to those wounds that were created. And then finally on day 18, he had the last round of surgery that was required for that first inpatient stay. So that's the, the surgery that Adams had to have until today. He's also had to undergo quite a number of x-rays as you can imagine. Um, this is, he's had six chest x-rays in total. He's had three CT scans. So he's essentially had his whole body CT scanned. He's had a total of 83 plane films of his limbs and that's including the x-rays he's had in theatre as well as afterwards. And he's had two MRI scans, one looking at his knee and one looking at the nerves in that left arm. And after all of that surgery and all of those x-rays, this is what Adam looks like now on the inside. So when he goes through the uh, x-ray machine at the airport, he's going to um, raise a few eyebrows, I would suggest. So Adam's journey up until now has involved him being an inpatient um, at the Alfred Hospital up until the 24th of August and up until the 9th he was actually in intensive care because of all the surgery he required um, it was easier to keep him in intensive care where we could control his pain well. He then went off to rehab and we only left rehab last week so he's had the better part of the last couple of months in hospital. Since discharge though from the Alfred and while he's been an inpatient at rehab he's had a number of appointments back at the Alfred to see the various surgeons and to have a number of other tests done. I'm going to hand over to Scott now, who's going to go through some of Adam's injuries, in particular the injuries that are causing him the most significant loss of function at the moment. Thanks, Kate. Um, so this is a short video of Adam, it's particularly showing the debilita or the um, disability he has in his left upper limb as a result of the injury to the nerves in his brachial plexus. So what he's going to be doing is he's going to try and use both limbs symmetrically all the way through this video. So the left limb, as you'll see, is the affected limb. He is trying to do the same thing with the left side as the right side right now. He can't lift his arm up because of the nerve injury in the neck. 
He can't lift his arm forward because of the nerve injury in the neck. He can't flex his elbow because of the nerve injury in the neck to the brachial plexus. He can't rotate the arm, the humerus bone, the arm bone, which means he can't position the arm in space out in front of him, even if he did have elbow flexion. So despite the paralysis of the shoulder and the elbow, if I support the forearm and go through motions with his hand, his wrist and finger function is preserved. So he's got terrible shoulder, terrible elbow, but good wrist and excellent hand. So this is called a partial brachial plexus palsy and it's one of the commonest patterns we see. Uh, just to show a few images of the periphery of his limb to remind us that the brachial plexus is one of a number of injuries which Kate's outlined and he's obviously got these souvenirs from his injury thus far in the peripheral limb which he's also dealing with. He's got minor complaints to this as well. He's got ongoing problems with his legs. He's got uh, ongoing uh, rehabilitation, what have you, for his other limbs but we're just going to concentrate now on the brachial plexus for a while because it, it really does show um, the importance uh, of the mechanism of injury and the severity of the injury and the speed of an injury in terms of what happens to a patient. So just a brief um, introduction. The brachial plexus is the name of the nerves that emerge from the spine and run uh, there's five large nerve roots that come out of the spine. There's a complex course that they have before emerging into the upper limb uh, to supply all the feeling and all the power for the upper limb. And after head, neck, upper limb trauma, it is injured in various patterns such as Adam's patterns and as I said this is one of his many injuries. That's a schematic picture of the right brachial plexus and as you can see it's quite a complicated structure but in essence it's the uh, it's the nerve structure between the spine and the periphery that mediates the function in the limb. Now, as I said the degree of individual nerve injury direct relate, directly relates to the nature of the trauma and without doubt the higher the velocity of the trauma, the greater the trauma. On the minor end of the spectrum, I'll see patients who might have bruised nerves and those patients uh, likely recover without needing surgical intervention. If you increase the severity of the trauma, increase the speed of your accident, the nerves will be internally disrupted. And in those patients, it is possible to have some recovery, but it is unpredictable and incomplete and often these patients need surgery. And if you escalate the level of the trauma further, increase the speed, make things more undesirable, then the nerves will be completely severed and recovery without intervention simply will not happen. So in Adam's case, the upper three nerves of his brachial plexus have been completely severed from a functional point of view. He had a little bit of bruising of the lower ones, but they are already recovered. So 60% of the nerves that are supposed to be in Adam's arm are not working. Um, as I mentioned, his injury we call a partial brachial plexus palsy, the upper part, but in a complete brachial plexus palsy, you'll have the same shoulder and elbow that you saw in Adam, but in addition to that, the wrist and hand will not work and the entire limb has no feeling. It's an absolutely devastating injury. That's This is a picture of a right brachial plexus. This is C5 and C6 nerve roots coming out to form the upper part of the brachial plexus. This is the C7 nerve root coming out. This is a complete palsy. This is the C8 nerve root and the T1 nerve root. And you can see these little stringy spaghetti-like things. They're the rootlets of the nerve that have literally been ripped out of the spine. So this patient has a completely flail, useless, paralyzed, insensate limb. Now, this isn't, a, this isn't a surgical education seminar, but just to summarise, the, the way we approach surgery for these injuries now is a combination of these techniques. We may repurpose residual functioning nerves in the limb from their working but less important function, and we might move them to create and restore function in a, a paralysed component. It's called a nerve transfer. Nerve transfers in the last 10 years have actually revolutionised treatment for these type of injuries. Uh, previously, we would do nerve grafting as our primary reconstruction where you would bridge the damaged segment of nerve. It's not just like the nerve is cut. The nerve is ripped asunder and there is a 
long segment that is not working and that needs to be spanned across with, the, with nerve grafts. Another technique we use is tendon transfers. Uh, tendon transfer is analogous to a nerve transfer in that we use tendons that are actually working but can be sacrificed and rerouted to a more important purpose. Sometimes we, well frequently, especially in the complete brachial plexus palsy, we'll import a new muscle from somewhere else in the body and join its blood vessels and its nerves up to nerves that we know will work in order to restore function in the limb. That's called a free muscle transfer. And in other cases, we will fuse joints or stiffen them deliberately surgically to stabilize them or create better function above or below that stabilized joint. So they're just conceptually te techniques we do use day in, day out for these injuries. Now, we're not gonna dwell on this, but this is a major nerve here. You can see that uh, this has been opened up and dissected under the operating microscope. Part of it has been cut that the patient can cope without and moved up here. And that's actually a microsurgical joint to the nerve going to bicep. So this patient's got, just like Adam, and Adam's gonna have this operation, no function in the biceps muscle. So this nerve, which was going down to the wrist, which isn't necessary, has been repurposed and put onto the biceps nerve and joint here under high power mic uh, under the microscope. And similarly, from a different adjacent nerve, this is another nerve that's been repurposed from its old function, which is sacrificable and rerouted to the brachialis muscle, which is the second main flexor of the elbow. Uh, this is this final technique slide, because we're not gonna to talk too much about technique, but this muscle here, you can see, this is someone's chest wall being opened. All the nerves have been harvested from between the patient's ribs because they're not from the brachial plexus and those nerves are working. This muscle has been brought up from the patient's leg and attached to a rib, tunneled down the arm. This is the end of the tendon, which is gonna go down onto the finger flexing tendons. The blood vessels have to be uh, joined under the microscope to bring this muscle back to life. And then the nerves from between the ribs are joined onto the muscle. So they will then power this muscle. So that's an example of a free muscle flap, which is a very common technique we now use uh, for patients with this injury. Now, irrespective of which combination of techniques any individual patient needs, the rehabilitation phase is lengthy and critical. And it involves hand therapists and physiotherapists. It involves regular surgical review. The frequency that the patient may come to a hospital or to a clinic um, for review and treatment is anywhere between second daily to second weekly, depending on what pattern of injury they've had and where they are in their rehabilitation and they require ongoing rehabilitation for two to five years. In addition to those formal appointments, they'll have a home program that they need to work on and the most diligent patients will have the best results and we're strongly encouraging a home program. But the picture I'm trying to paint is that this is a complete, um, a massive undertaking for the patient and uh, a long undertaking for the patient. In addition to that, during the rehabilitation phase, they may require additional further surgeries to optimize their long-term result. What can one expect after having their brachial plexus reconstructed? What, what, what's the future for Adam? Well, a complete brachial plexus palsy. So this is a patient who's a bit worse than Adam, but unfortunately the second commonest um, pattern of palsy is a complete brachial plexus palsy. They will commonly require four to eight major surgeries their function will usually plateau about four or five years after their injury. Uh, and under ideal circumstances and all going well, you can restore a helper hand level of function for that patient. If they were left-handed and they injured their left hand, they will now be right-handed. It's a life-changing injury. Uh, often with a complete brachial, complete brachial plexus palsy, you'll have ongoing chronic pain, which is frequently very debilitating. And commonly these patients, mostly due to the pain, but often due to pain and function, may never return to work. After a partial brachial plexus palsy like Adams, the, um, the fact that there are some residual function going to the wrist and hand gives many more reconstructive opportunities. Uh, it is a more predictable course requiring two or three surgeries usually the plateau of function is usually two to three years after or injury and reconstruction. And in ideal circumstances and all going well, you can actually restore excellent function to the limb. 
in these patients, the pain is often well controlled or settles over time uh, and return to work for people like Adam is usual but not guaranteed. So literally this morning, Adam was at our brachial plexus meeting at 6.45 this morning for planning his care with our multidisciplinary team at the Alfred. And our hope for Adam with his proposed upcoming surgery is that he'll have a good outcome, but it's a long road ahead. And unfortunately for him, there's no guarantees. I'll just hand back to Kate. Thank you very much, Scott. So returning to to the, the um, topic of injury and road trauma specifically, one of the questions is, well, why was Adam so badly injured? He was doing all the right things. He took all of the right precautions in riding his motorbike. And I think this is one of the briefs we had in presenting um, a case today and why we chose ASM is that he is a very good example of the importance of speed and some of the things that we can control when we use the road. And that's for all of us. We know that I'm now going to try to explain a little bit of, of physics. So apologies to those in the room who may have moaned and groaned during physics in high school. But a moving body, whether it's, it's a person or a car or a motorbike, it has kinetic energy just by, by virtue of the fact that it's moving. And when that body stops, that energy needs to go somewhere or it's converted to other forms of energy. So Adam's kinetic energy when his bike was stopped suddenly by the car that pulled out in front of him was converted to mainly the, um, the compression and the shearing forces, but also heat and cavitation. But it's these forces, in particular the shearing forces that uh, um, damage the nerves in his neck or the nerves of his brachial plexus and those those compression and cavitation injuries caused all of the other soft tissue, the bone injuries and the muscle injuries that he also sustained, as well as the ruptured lung that he had on that left-hand side. Now, to, in trying to, to look at the ways that we can limit the amount of energy, therefore, that we see transferred to the human body in an accident, we need to think about what are the laws of the kinetic energy and what are the factors that influence how much energy is transferred. We know that it's, 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 it's energy that's possessed by a moving object, but it's determined by two things. The first being the, the mass or the weight of that object, which we usually can't change too much when it comes to human beings. We've done a lot of advance with regards to motor vehicles and motorbikes, they're lighter than they were, but also the velocity or the speed at which that body or that, that object is moving. Now, when you look at this equation, it's, it, it becomes obvious that speed matters more than weight. And when we consider the moving energy, the speed actually has more impact on the amount of energy that we see than um, what the weight does. For example, if you were to double the weight, you'll double the energy. But if instead of doubling the weight, you doubled the speed or the velocity, you'll actually quadruple the energy. So the energy will go up exponentially in regards to the speed at which that body is traveling, um, where in, with the weight, it just goes up um, at the same, same amount. So to use an example, for example, a rider, an average 70 kilogram male, um, traveling at about 60 kilometers per, per hour, will have about 126,000 joules of energy, which needs to go somewhere if that person stops suddenly. There's also then the amount of energy from the, the bike itself. Now a rider going at five kilometers less will only have 106,000 joules that needs to go somewhere. A rider going at five kilometres more, at 65 kilometres per hour, it goes up to 148,000. So you can see there's quite a significant difference of about a third or a little bit less in that energy in the difference between 55 and 65 kilometres per hour. So speed is an important factor. And if you then consider the energy that needs to come from the motorbike, which you know we'll say weighs about 170, 180 kilograms, we're looking at about another 300,000 joules that some of that energy is going to be imparted onto the rider. Not all of it, Adam was ejected, so he didn't have to take a lot of the energy from the bike. But when he first went into the side of the car, some of that energy was transferred to him from the bike. And this is where, and this energy all makes a big difference. It can be the difference between a complete brachial plexus injury or a partial brachial plexus injury, or just some bruising of the brachial plexus, which the consequences for the patient, the consequences for Adam is whether or not he can actually use his arm and now the journey he's about to embark on to have that arm reconstructed or the function reconstructed. So how do we protect our road users considering this? There's a, there's a lot of things that obviously um, the, that we, we can look at and there's a lot of work that's been done around improving the roads, improving the vehicles that we use, 
Um, we have road legislation to help keep people safe. We can think about, well, if we needed to build the ideal human being in order to withstand any of these forces, what would the ideal human being look like? And this is roughly what we would look like. And this is Graham. So um, I, I do recommend if you have the time, you get onto the website and just using your favourite search engine, put in TAC and Graham and a really good interactive um, session will come up. And this is essentially what you would need to look like in order to withstand a motorbike accident and not have a brachial plexus injury and all of the fractures that Adam ended up sustaining. And you can see that Graham has a very thick head. He has a very, very thick neck. And that's to withstand those and to to absorb the shearing forces and the energy that would be transferred to that part of the body that we're so vulnerable to at the moment as we stand. Obviously we can't genetically engineer humans to look like this and I'm not sure we'd actually want to look like this quite frankly. So one of the things that we can control and all and this is all of us as road users is the speed and and I guess what we're trying to get across is that even just a small difference in speed can make a significant difference to the clinical outcome at the end of the day and in Adam's case, the number of nerve roots that he actually has that are functioning and whether or not he'll be able to have some reasonable function restored to that limb, which we're very hopeful he will be able to after his next round of treatment. So just in summary and in conclusion, um, injury is common, in particular road trauma is common. We have excellent facilities here in Victoria to treat you if you are unfortunately injured on the road. But it's, not, it's, it's also the non-life-threatening injuries that still have a profound effect on our lives. It's not just the people who die and, and all of the people they affect. It's also the, it's all the many, many, many more hundreds of um, people who go on to, to live with the injuries and the consequences of their road trauma. Speed is one of those factors that has a major impact on the energy transferred in a road um, traffic accident. And since we can't be built like Graham, we do need to look at being able to travel at a speed that's appropriate for the prevailing conditions of the day, taking into consideration where we are, the speed limit, and also the, um, the, the weather and road conditions. So I think it's important to thank Adam and his wife, Jenny, for um, contributing to this. There will be some video footage available eventually. They're about to celebrate their first wedding anniversary this coming weekend. Um, and also thank you very much to the, also the College of Surgeons um, Trauma Committee who helped to set up this, this initiative. Thank you. So what we're doing now is opening this up for a lot of questions. So I hope you can take the time uh, to shoot a few in and really engage with our, our surgeons today and, and find out some greater details to what they see every day. Um, what we've tried to do is the face of trauma just across the country is around 39,000 people are killed and seriously injured. So we've tried to tell the story of just one example. Um, just a quick question to start with. Uh, how does trauma vary with regards to age? So the young versus someone like Adam versus the older sort of people out on the road. So um, we're certainly seeing a change in the demographics of the patients who present to our emergency departments with trauma, in particular road trauma. While traditionally in the past it's been the, the younger road user, um, the male road user who's a bit more prone to risk taking, we're certainly seeing now an increased number of our baby boomers presenting into the emergency department. People are remaining active for longer um, and they have the money to spend, particularly on motorbikes and nice cars. And so they're, they're out there and about, so we are now seeing an increasing number where they're almost going to equal the number of young people admitted through our emergency departments. Unfortunately, as the body ages, it's less able to absorb um, the impact of that energy transfer and the energy transfer um, per unit of energy. So for example, per joule causes much more damage to the body as you can imagine. Um, so in a 60 year old person compared to, to a 30 year old fit healthy male. And the other thing about uh, the implications of age is someone's reconstructive um, opportunity and uh, ability. So uh, there are certain procedures that you'll undertake on a younger patient that you will not undertake on an older patient either because the uh, duration of the surgery or the complexity of the rehabilitation will not be tolerated by the older patient and therefore you're wasting their time and so they'll accept a lesser reconstruction by virtue of them being older and not being able to heal a more complicated reconstruction. Great, we've got questions coming in uh, galore now. So question, first question I'll draw on the audience is um, 
Uh, one here from Nick. I have young kids in car seats. Do these seats have special features that mitigate nerve issues, severe trauma, and what are the key aspects to make sure they're effective? I guess one of the key aspects to making sure they're effective is that they're used correctly, the way um, they are designed to be used. And virtually all of the safety um, devices we have for cars and helmets and things like that are used to minimise or, or to reduce the amount of energy that is transferred to one specific area of the body. So the car seats are designed to keep the child from bouncing about within the car because that's where you'll get additional energy transferred to the child, but then also to dissipate the energy across the child rather than having it focused in one area. Um, so that, you know, I'm a surgeon rather than an expert in um, the physics of, of um, injury, but that's essentially the basis on which they're designed to work. Uh, question here from David, uh, and we will make those changes with regards to the kinetic energy, he just makes a correction with regards to the calculations. Mm -hmm. um, David says here, what is Adam's attitude towards motorcycling now? Will he get back on the bike? Adam's interesting. He's got a few hobbies, one of which was motorcycle riding, and he's reflecting on that currently. Um, patients with brachial plexus injury fall into two camps usually. There's the patient who the bike is normally a ride-off, and they never buy another one. And then occasionally you have a patient who, despite that, just wants to quickly get fixed up so they can get back on their new bike. And uh, Adam's erring towards the not riding anymore, but I don't think he's committed to that yet. A question here from Sue, uh, maybe in your realm, given that road barriers also impact road trauma, what suggestions do you have for the type of barriers that would reduce trauma to riders and drivers? You go first. I was going to say that's not in my skill set. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this this is off this question often comes up there there are two we all use the roads and so we all have an obligation to look after ourselves as well as other road users as well um, any sort of barrier what we what we aim to do or what it aims to do is to limit the injury to all road users as well as the actual person who's had the accident something that dissipates the energy um, gradually is better so you, for example in the motor motor GPs where you see the professional bike riders they'll have barriers that absorb the energy so we'll compress to a degree rather than being solid. Now it would be great if along all of our split highways we could have that sort of barrier system and maybe in the utopia that will be the, the case but at the moment we, we don't have we don't have that. The barriers my understanding at the moment and this is not my air expertise is, is to protect um, the drivers and the users on the other side of the road as well. It also, when a, when a rider comes off a motorbike in particular, if they go into the pathway of an oncoming car, it's almost universally fatal. Um, you know, that's, that's not something, it's, it's, it's not only are they coming off the bike and the energy transfer from that, they then have the energy transfer from that other vehicle coming in the other direction. Um, and that's virtually, it's universally fatal, that sort of incident. There's an interesting question there from Martin about, um, denialists of speed uh, and the fact that Adam was traveling at 60 kilometers per hour. When I first met Adam uh, and we were giving him the rather bleak news about his future, um, and I must say Adam's got an amazingly resilient uh, temperament and I think that will bode well for his reconstruction. But he said to me, thank goodness Scott, I was only doing the speed limit. Imagine if I was going faster. Uh, because there are many people on roads that are 60 who will be doing 70 or 75 or even 65. And if his trauma had if his trauma had been at a high velocity, I have no doubt that his nerve injury and all his injuries uh, would be more severe with completely life-changing consequences. Uh, as Kate said, he was actually travelling at the speed limit, wearing all the appropriate protective gear, trying to drive defensively. And it was the decision made by an, another road user that has caused this accident. Uh, so I think it's just a lesson in terms of defensive driving and, and the fact that, as Kate said earlier, we can change cars, we can change roads, we can change speeds, we can do all these things. But it's a bit like the Swiss cheese analogy that everything needs to go your way for you to not be injured. And uh, 
it's a very difficult and ongoing process to um, legislate this and regulate this uh, for all of us. And that's, that's one of the most difficult things is it's a free flowing environment out there. So you can do as much as you want in that case. And I guess that's an interesting point. So the innocent bystander, um, do you see that quite often come across your, come across you? Yes. <laughs> in a word. Yes, yeah. yeah, but yeah. It, it, it's, it's even more, you know, if someone's taken, you know, if a patient comes in intoxicated, breaking the law and they have a single vehicle accident, it, it does give you a different sentiment to someone who is crossing at the lights at a pedestrian crossing with green and someone breaking the law runs them down and ruins their life forever. It, it is it is a common thing to see an innocent bystander present to the trauma centre. Yes, absolutely. How do you guys deal with that as well? Just as um, seeing that thing day to day, how does it sort of affect you guys? I think um, one of the things with, with our trauma patients is that none of them plan to be there. Um, it's always at an inconvenient time. And I never cease to, amazed, to be amazed at the resilience of our patients and how, how strong they are and that desire to get better. Um, a lot of people are there, um, you know, some are there through, through accidents, some are there through making just bad decisions as well. Um, we, we all go through periods in our life where we think we're invincible um, and but the, the, the gen, generally human beings, they'll, they'll, they'll see, they'll take on board what's happened and, and I'm, I'm forever sort of amazed at how resilient people can be and, and just soldier on and actually get better despite some of the um, horrific injuries that they sustain or that those around them sustain. It's not just the patients, it's actually all of their friends and family that go along with the journey with them. Um, it's an area where we can make a big difference, um, that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of research going on into trauma and most of the things that we do are pretty straightforward and a lot of it comes down to human factors, it comes down to teamwork, it comes down to being organised, it comes down to having a system in getting the patients um, to the right place at the right time and that's where we've seen a, a dramatic improvement in the outcomes for our patients in trauma. Uh, Bill's asking a question about seatbelt injury, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good question. And absolutely, Bill, there are a lot of injuries caused by seatbelts, but universally the injury caused by the seatbelt is less than the injury that would be caused without the seatbelt. The types of injuries you see, you'll see um, skin abrasions or uh, friction burns and sometimes even full thickness skin necrosis and in women necrosis of part of the breast from the pressure effect of the seatbelt on the chest wall. And, and these patient, patients do need uh, surgery. And, you know, I've done some breast reconstructions on patients who've lost, you know, half their breast. Um, but in all of these patients, devastating though those injuries are, you, you shudder to think what the injury to the rest of them would have been had they not been restrained. And your question about uh, seatbelt design, I think it's pretty well established that harness seatbelts are better than lap sash seatbelts, but there's an issue of compliance. You're better Correct. off having everybody using a lap sash than some people using a harness and some people using no seatbelt. Or just across the, the waist or, or not worn lap correctly. Belt. That's where a lot of damage. And absolutely. So in the pre-seatbelt pre era, the amount of facial trauma and particularly severe head and chest trauma um, was was much more significant. Now we do see injuries that are, are I guess, technically caused by the seatbelt, but they don't tend to be the life-threatening injuries that we once saw. Um, the other area that's injured is that the bowel can can be ruptured, can pop because as a loop, it just as the seatbelt tensions across the lower abdomen. This is particularly the case if it's not worn correctly, if the seatbelt's worn too high across the tummy rather than across the lower part of the tummy and across the bony pelvis. There was another couple of questions there again about um, improvements in car design and have we seen changes in um, injury patterns? Absolutely. And certainly with the advent of side airbags, we are seeing far less of the fatal um, head injuries that we used to see, particularly those head injuries at the scene where the patients never get to hospital. And because we're seeing patients survive some injuries now, we are left with other injuries that we are dealing with more often. And we are certainly dealing with far more chest trauma than we used to because the patients are surviving. Um, in the past, they died from their head injuries or their, their ruptured vessels. And I wonder 
too, if that's the case with some of these um, devastating limb injuries, because we're, we're not having as many deaths from brain trauma and from exsanguination or loss of blood, we are now have more patients survive and therefore have more injuries to treat in the long term. I think it's a question here from Stephen and Bevan, I could sort of combine the two. Um, they're sort of really putting a question on, on the cost, so we've, we've seen very much the, the personal side of it. But how much does it sort of cost for the rehabilitation and, and dealing with them in the hospital uh, to get them through the system as well? I know it's a bit of a loaded question. Um, so again, I'm not a, a health economist, however, um, in the there was a study out of New South Wales, I think it was about two or three years ago. Um, I, I, I think I know who I won't say who the author was in case I've got it wrong, but looking at the cost to society. So yes, it, it costs millions to have a trauma sense system and to treat these patients. Um, but the cost to society overall by not preventing these injuries and not treating them far outweighs what we end up paying. And it's up to us, does society think this is something that we should be paying for? I think most people that in the, the, or the pub test would say yes. As a society, this is something that is worth investing in because it affects still currently predominantly younger people who will have lost working years and lost years of life. Um, and so it costs millions to treat, but the, the long-term benefit to society is quite significant. The other thing about funding for motor vehicle trauma is the TAC system. Absolutely. And, um, the reality is that when everyone pays their registration, they're paying their TAC component, um, and that is the money that is invested in treating, you know, the vast majority of these patients. And uh, it's actually quite a good system in that regard because it's self-funding by the user. Now, like any health system, there are certain parts of the certain parts of the community that utilise the system more than others, but I think you need to have a system and the current system is quite good. The specifics of the costs, um, just if you if you take away all Adam's other injuries and just look at his brachial plexus injury, uh, if he only needs two surgeries and two years of rehabilitation, his total uh, healthcare bill for all that will be hundreds of thousands, I would expect, in the lower hundreds, roughly speaking. And a question here from David. Um, what is the effect of delay in getting to hospital? So how important is that? So it has, it, it's very important. And um, a lot of the work around putting together the Victorian trauma system was to get the patient to the right place at the right time. Um, it has, it, it's important for two reasons. One, for those immediately or soon to be life-threatening injuries, such as problems with breathing or problems with blood loss. Um, we, we talk about the golden hour. And so for every delay in, in um, a minute, the mortality goes up by almost 1%. So it's about a one for one. So getting patients who are bleeding or have problems breathing um, to care quickly is, is paramount. And that's where we've made most of our gains over the last 10 years. We also take the care to the patient's roadside in that our paramedics do a lot of, a lot of the treatment they administer um, is administered by doctors only in many parts of the world and, and quite frankly the rest of Australia. So we're quite lucky in that our paramedics are some of the most highly skilled in the world in the things that they do. The second area though that's important from a time critical point of view is the, the loss of function, particularly of limbs but also of the brain. So if the brain has a period of time without enough oxygen or not enough blood, if the blood pressure is low, while that patient may not have sustained a significant head injury initially, they will then develop a brain injury through lack of oxygen and blood. Um, so that then gives them a secondary insult. And then same thing with the limbs. If the, if the bleeding to the, if the blood supply to the limbs is cut off or there's a lot of swelling that's preventing the, the muscle from getting enough blood, those limbs will then, um, will then suffer significant um, repercussions and there are limbs that have been lost simply because the patient couldn't get to a surgeon who was able to reconstruct that blood flow in a timely fashion for them. I don't know if Scott wants to add to that. I don't just agree. <laughs> Time is critical. There's, a, that there's, there's certain procedures that you'll undertake. If the patient's arrived to the Alfred or the trauma service um, in a short time frame and they've got an ischemic limb, then there's reconstruction you can offer that if they arrive, you know, six hours after the injury that you cannot offer. So time is critical. Um, question here from Robert, and I think it sort of draws on just clarifying what isn't uh, non-threatening. So in the last slide reference was made to non-life-threatening injuries. Were Adam's injuries life-threatening? 
if they weren't, what sort of injuries qualify as being life-threatening? Okay. So we talk about life-threatening in the two types. There's the immediately life-threatening. So if someone is has a has a has a knife stuck into their their leg and they slice the femoral artery, you've got only a few minutes before that person's going to lose all of their blood. So that's immediately life-threatening. Um, then there is the soon-to-be life-threatening, and, and Adam did have a collapsed lung that would eventually become life-threatening, but with our system, is easily able to be treated. It was actually first treated at the roadside by the paramedics and then formally treated in the, in the hospital. So anything that affects the oxygenation and the blood flow to tissues is considered life-threatening. I also include in that significant brain injuries because eventually a severe brain injury is a, effectively a life-threatening injury. And if, if a patient has a non-survivable brain injury, even though their heart's beating and their lungs are breathing, um, they, they may eventually become, become brain dead, which is, is a non-survivable um, situation as well. So Adam's lung was collapsed. He was able to cope with that. We were able to deal with it in a timely fashion. But if he had been at the side of the road and not found for a period of time, that may have become life-threatening. The rest of his limbs, um, as long as he has what's considered standard care in Australia, would not be considered life-threatening. Um, if they were to become infected um, or if he was to have problems with the broken bones, sending little bits of, of fatty tissue up into his vessels, they can become life-threatening. But with our care that we offer in Australia now, that tends not to happen. Pelvic fracture. Pelvic fractures, absolutely. You can bleed to death from a pelvic fracture. Um, here's a great question from Amy. Uh, do you think that serious injuries should be reported by the media more so than fatalities now, given that thousands of Victorians that have their lives changed from road trauma compared to a few hundred now that pass away? Um, yes, but it's, and, and we certainly look at major trauma um, figures as, as a profession, we look at major trauma figures rather than just fatalities. I guess the challenge is how do you, how do you present that to the public? in a format that's meaningful. And um, one of the things we've started to do now is look at quality of life outcomes after severe trauma. So we have a way of rating a, a trauma, whether or not a patient has been severely injured. And it's basically looking at all of their injuries, giving them a score and adding them up. And so in Victoria, what we've been doing for the nearly the last 10 years now is following our major trauma patients up, every single one of them, not just those at the major trauma services. They get followed up by the Victorian Trauma Registry and they have a questionnaire done um, intermittently. I think it's six months and then 12 months and then every year after that to look at their quality of life and have they returned to the function they were before their accident? Do they have chronic pain? Um, do they have things like post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety as a result? Are they disabled in any other way? Um, and so if we could start to report those sorts of figures, which we now have some good Good, um, good data on, it might put it into a different perspective for people because what we're trying to do with this story today is show that it's, it's not just the people who die, it's all of the, the many more people that, are, that, that get injured and live with those consequences. Great. Um, question here from Hugh. Do the types of injuries vary with the type of vehicle, e.g. motorcyclist injuries against an SUV driver industry, injuries I should say? Uh, certainly with my particular practice profile, I see a lot more severe injuries in the motorcycle rather than the motor, than the car accident and essentially it's because the motorcyclist is unrestrained and unprotected whereas if someone hits you in your car you've at least got a first line of defence of the door or the bonnet or the boot depending on which direction they're coming from. But if you're on your motorbike the first thing they may hit is your leg and uh, the common things we'll see are badly badly fractured lower limbs, the tibia and fibula that um, have soft tissue defects over them and then require importation of uh, tissue from elsewhere in the body to patch the hole over the broken bone to give the bone a chance to heal and you're much more likely to have that kind of injury on a motorbike than in a motor car. And similarly with the uh, brachial plexus injuries we've been talking about with Adam, um, you're much more likely to have a brachial plexus injury if you have a motorbike accident compared to a motor car accident. So uh, yes, the, the type of vehicle does make a difference. I don't know if Kate's got a comment about SUVs versus sedans or other. Um, so so yeah, and again, it comes down to that that energy transfer. The a vehicle that the occupant sits in tends to have systems in place in order to the crumple zones in order to absorb that energy rather than the energy all being transferred 
to the patient, the rider. Pedestrians is the other group that um, suffer more severe injuries when they're hit by a car, even going at a moderate speed. SUVs versus other cars, look, I, again, it's not my specialty, other than to say we know that as um, the safety features of cars have improved, we're certainly seeing less of the severe life-threatening injuries, particularly the head and spine injuries that we used to see a lot of. Um, are you seeing a bit of a change as well with improving safety technology with regards to the vulnerable users, um, where there might be a less less of an impact happening to them at all? So with regards to cameras within AEV, the sensors, those sort of yeah. things. Yeah, look, I, I, I'd have to. You'd have to look at the statistics. Not, not anecdotally. I guess what we are seeing though is um, when people come in from older cars, they tend to be more severely injured because they haven't got the safety features. And in the unfortunately, in the older driver, we're seeing it is it is um, accidents resulting from getting the, the accelerator confused with the brake and and things like that, or rather than a, a safety failure of the vehicle as such. Um, probably when it comes to to concentration and distraction within cars, that tends to be something more for that younger generation, is my understanding. And that's where there's a lot of that's where I think the the, the um, benefits will arise in that the, the distracted driver and, and giving them those warning signs if they're about to um, crash or do something. Great. I've got a question here from Maz, I think, which is, goes a little bit further. Um, types of crashes, uh, what sort of differences do you see between um, the injuries incurred with regards to a head-on head, head on versus a T-bone? Um, historically, has there been a bit more of a trend and is this changing over time? Um, again, so we, depending on the the direction of the energy and where it's transferred, we do see different patterns. And this is really important to us as trauma surgeons, we who resuscitate the patients from the beginning, we like to know exactly how the accident happened. So for example, in a driver who is, um, so a car that is turning right and is T-boned into the passenger side by a car um, coming through an intersection, for example, for that passenger in the front seat, you'll see a lot of impact. You'll see injuries to the left upper limb. You'll see injuries to the left ribs. You'll see injuries to the spleen and the pelvis gets compressed. So we look for patterns of injury based on the direction of the force. In patients that are involved in um, head-on collisions, there's a double whammy. There's the force of the car that they're traveling in, the kinetic energy of that car, but then there's also the kinetic energy of the car traveling into them. So it's almost like it's double the amount of energy depending on the size of the other vehicle and the speed at which it's traveling. And with those type of injuries, what we tend to see is the acceleration, the acceleration type of injuries where the patient's body will stop, the outside of the body will stop, but all of the internal organs will continue to move forward. And that has devastating consequences for the brain and has devastating consequences for the major blood vessels, particularly within the chest. And other than having some way of, of having a crumple zone to decrease the to, to increase the time over which that energy is transferred so it's not all so quickly, no amount of safety features is going to prevent those injuries. If the brain gets shaken around inside the vault of the head because you've stopped suddenly, there's nothing else you can do. The no amount of airbags are going to help prevent that. That's just the patient moving at a fast speed and all of a sudden stopping. So yes, we do see differences in the patterns of injury um, in the in the mechanism. The other thing that changed uh, is the incidence of head-on versus head-on. So 100 kilometre versus yes. 100 kilometre hour injury has decreased mm -hmm. as the number of divided highways increases. Correct. And that has been a fantastic advance that uh, has evolved over the last decade or two. Decade or two. And the other thing uh, in terms of direction of impact, um, some motorcyclists, uh, if they're hit on the side, they, you know, oftentimes that's when you'll get the terrible leg trauma. Uh, whereas if the motorcyclist strikes the car on the side of the car head on, the, the motorcyclist not infrequently will eject off the bike and go over the car and actually not be directly impacted on the car and have more chance to slow down. So paradoxically, when they get thrown, they may have lesser injuries to the lower limbs at least. So there is a different pattern of injury with different mechanism of injury, yes. Um, what sort of uh, injuries do you see from rear end collisions? I see a lot of spine injury where the front of the body is forced forward, the head sort of lags behind. Um, sometimes then the, the face will um, flick forward and hit the steering wheel. 
um, depending on the age of the car, airbags may or may not go off. So it's predominantly um, neck injuries anecdotally. I have seen though some devastating fatal head injuries just from being still at the traffic lights and being hit from behind at speed. How long lasting can those sort of injuries be? They can make you quadriplegic, so it can be lifelong, or it can be a bit of whiplash, which is a bit uncomfortable for a couple of weeks and everything in between. Wow. Um, of course, we're going to have a, a good one here talking about the future. So another one here from Amy. Do you think autonomous vehicles will be a bit of a silver bullet to reducing road trauma? Uh, I'm not sure it'll be a silver bullet, but I'm optimistic that given the frequency of user error being the cause of the accident, that intuitively I believe that it should decrease the incidence of trauma, yes, but it remains to be seen. There's a lot of hurdles to jump over to get there, but uh, I'm optimistic that it will help, yes. I tend to agree with that. I think that's the feeling, but again, it's, it's, it's uncharted territory. I think as long as it's implemented correctly and carefully and thoughtfully with a lot of data collection along the way, um, if we could remove as much of the human factor as possible in errors, that would be, I think, a good thing. Stephen's asked a question there about um, safety equipment and it's relevant for Adam's case. So despite Adam having multiple devastating injuries on multiple limbs, by virtue of him having full protective gear on, he did not suffer the direct skin insults that many motorcyclists will suffer. So Stephen's asked about riding in shorts and thongs versus full leathers and boots. Um, it's less frequent now than it used to be, but often on a weekend you'd get called in because the motorcyclists come off and they've literally scraped off their skin for a whole leg and a whole torso and half their arm. And uh, the incidence that is less as people are more frequently wearing the correct uh, equipment correct protective equipment. Yes, being a Perth boy, I have seen many a motorbike leave Scarborough Beach. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, there's a good question here from Martin. Uh, given the maturity of the trauma management system in Australia, what do you think will be the next best trauma management investments for it to be made here in regards to reducing the volume and severity of death and disability? That's a good question. <laughs> I think I think a lot of this, the work with disability, um, so I'll deal with the disability first, and this is where Scott may have something to add as well. I think a lot of that will be looking at the 1% gain. So there won't be just one or two areas, it'll be improving everything we do just that little bit more. Can we get the patient to theatre that bit quicker? Can we have them resuscitated better so that they, their tissues are perfused better sooner so that it minimises that secondary trauma? Um, can we get their rehab starting earlier? Um, looking after their psychosocial well-being as much as their physical well-being. And so being far more multidisciplinary, we're already multidisciplinary, but being far more, but it's looking at those, those little one percenters and improving them across the board rather than in one particular area. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Scott? Um, yeah, I think it's a great question, Martin, and we could talk about that for about two hours. <laughs> it, it, interestingly, the Australian healthcare system is quite different to some other international systems and I think we're very good at treating the acute problem and we're reasonable at the rehabilitation uh, in terms of skill level and resources. There can always be more resources and everyone's always trying to upskill. But the other thing is to go full circle and continually evaluate the outcomes of what you are currently doing and that requires research. And I think uh, the institutional um, university teaching hospital model in the United States where there is a large um, number of people involved in research linked to the clinicians uh, doesn't happen in Australia and it's actually difficult to benchmark and, and do quality research and I think that actually targeted clinical research of actual outcomes uh, will guide us into where to invest our time and efforts in the future. I think that's where we uh, could improve. Just to add to that probably too, is so we, were, we finally got some federal funding um, last year with regards to our national trauma registry. So this is to link the trauma registries in all of the states and territories across Australia and 
hopefully ultimately New Zealand as well, so that we can actually track the outcomes of these patients and and then look for the why there is a difference because it's not the same all around Australia. We at Victoria are very lucky, for example, we don't have the tyranny of distance that much of our country does have to deal with. So what works best for Victoria will not work best for the rest of Australia and it's having a a purpose-built system for that area, for that group of patients, that's important. Right, we'll just begin winding up. So two last questions. Um, I'll combine one from Rob and Stephen. And I do apologise to everyone else. Um, there's got quite a lot of other ones here. Um, with the Australian Motor GP on this weekend, what message would you give all the road, uh, road users and what are your thoughts on the latest trends with regards to airbags being built into riding garments? I think anything that decreases the amount of energy transferred to a patient has got to be a good thing. So, um, you know, and airbags have revolutionised certainly car safety. And while again, this is not my area of expertise, if it decreases the amount of energy imparted on the on the motorcyclist, it can only be a good thing. With regards to the, the motor GP, you know, I've been down there before and it's great. You know, the atmosphere is fantastic, but on the way down there, on the way back home, you, you, you're not, you're not, you're not Wayne Gardner. I'm showing my age when I say Wayne Gardner. Aren't I? <laughs> you're not Wayne Gardner. You, you just, you just, you, you just got to drive to the conditions, drive to the road laws, and um, just get home safe. That's that's the thing, and that um, it's it's not a race down there and on the on the way back. Leave the racing for the riders. That's cool. <laughs> that's a nice, simple one. <laughs> um, and now my last sort of closing question before we begin uh, thanking you both. Would you like to give us a bit of a, a take-home, leave-alone sort of line? Um, that you'd like to share with everyone? Safety on the road is everybody's responsibility. Um, and we can't control everything, but we can control our own behaviour. I'd just say that um, I think people need to personalise the risk and not be deluded into thinking it won't happen to them because it might. So just be sensible. Thank you both, Kate and Scott, for coming in today. I, I know how incredibly busy you are, and when you're busy, you're saving lives. So thank you very much for taking your time and educating everyone else around what you guys see coming in. So um, thank you also to Adam and his wife, Jennifer. Um, they both came in and have featured a lovely video, which we'll share as well. Um, we'd like to thank our audience in particular for attending today and for the awesome questions which have come in. Uh, please keep up to date. Go to the RSVP website and sign up to our newsletter. And at the conclusion of this uh, webinar, we'll be circulating a survey. So if you can please complete that and give us your feedback, it helps us improve for the future. So thank you all.